Thank you, Adam. So, good evening, good evening, good evening. I believe that's the traditional beginning. Uh, tonight's keynote, as I was sitting down at the table just reflecting with my colleagues, um, involves dozens of processes, ten different applications, uh, four different clouds, three different programming languages, spread across five demos, all dependent on the network, followed, I believe, by dancing and possibly a kangaroo. I thought, what could possibly go wrong? <laughs> So tonight I want to talk to you about um, the new application architectures, a theme that sort of Graham touched on a little bit yesterday. In particular, when I reflect on it, the way that we have been building applications for much of the previous decade was really relatively stable, and we're all familiar with the patterns for doing that. But, you know, things are changing. The way that we build applications today, and especially maybe the way that we're going to build applications tomorrow, is starting to look a little bit different. And so tonight, I really want to do sort of three things. I want to talk about what's driving those changes. Why do we need new application architectures? What do they look like? You know, what, what is the fundamental change? And in particular, how do I go ahead and build these kind of applications using Spring? And you may get the impression from this that this is a talking three equal parts. That's actually not the case. I'm going to go through the first two items really quite quickly. We're going to spend most of our time in code and looking at, you know, sample code and apps and demos, etc. So what is causing all this change? What's the, what are these forces of disruption in the application landscape at the moment? And as I always seem to say every year, you know, it makes it both a time of uncertainty, but also an incredibly exciting time, because lots of stuff changes, and you know, there's lots of new things to learn and to get to grips with. And I hear um, a number of different things coming out when I talk to developers, when I talk to customers, when I go, go out and do visits, etc. And these are some of the things in the mix. Um, one is, of course, as we all know, user expectations are changing. What they expect from a good application. They want a much richer experience. Maybe there's social integration. Maybe there's much more sort of real-time contextual delivery of information. Um, whatever it is, you know, the expectation of an app, it's not just a form on a web page anymore. You know, it's much more than that. Moreover, they want to access those applications across a range of different devices. You all know the statistics. You've seen the demographics, etc. The traditional sort of PC and desktop browser is no longer the dominant client. That's really important if you're building a business-to-consumer application, but increasingly it matters for apps that go out to your partners and even to your own employees. And so we've got to think about uh, taking advantage of different kinds of devices, which is all tied into this idea of giving a really rich experience. On the other hand, expectations inside corporations are changing. In particular, sort of business leaders and things are looking outside and they're seeing what's happening with other companies and what's possible on the cloud and some of the models that are there and saying, why can't I get that kind of speed and agility and maybe cost models inside my own organization? And so there are pressures for transformation internally. We heard yesterday about the changes in data. You know, there is much more data. We're dealing with unstructured as well as structured data. We need to be more flexible. Um, I'm not going to dwell on that particularly tonight. You know, that's been well covered in the conference. Quality of service expectations. Does your app need to be internet scale? Well, you know, we all know many of them actually don't need to be internet scale, but maybe a more nuanced question. Does your app need to be able to survive outage of a data center, outage of an Amazon region, for example? Do you have an architecture that can cope with that? By the end of the evening, hopefully, I'll show you how to build such things with Spring. Finally, I, you know, I believe that we're actually inevitably heading to a world in which when we look at the, sort of the IT estate of a company, it will be a hybrid world that mixes some things that are going on inside the company's own data centers and some things that are happening genuinely outside in the cloud. Um, you already see when you go out and talk to organizations that there are things around the fringes in many established companies happening on the clouds, pockets of things moving there. Um, some companies, of course, are much more strategic and doing it centrally. But maybe even if you're a very conservative company, at some point, some hot, you know, new company that's growing now, perhaps it starts on the cloud, stays on the cloud, and you do an acquisition, you're in a heterogeneous world. And so you know, we are moving inevitably toward a world of you know, hybrid estates. And we need to think about applications that can span and integrate in that kind of environment. So. What's what, you know, the really big picture, fundamentally what's kind of changing, we're moving from a world 
over the last decade of really building server-side applications rendered out to you know, a fairly dumb device and we're moving to a world of much smarter client applications that talk to services on the server side. So it's client-side apps and server-side services. Very briefly, kind of let me show you in how that plays out. This should be a very familiar picture. Um, it's not taken directly from any of our spring training materials, but it might as well have been. You know, it's, it's a very, very familiar sort of thing that we've been talking about at these conferences for a long time. And this architecture was born in a world when, frankly, um, we treated the browser pretty much like it was a 3270 terminal. You know, it was there to render the, you know, the view that it was given, and it didn't have much more capability. And we all know that now, a modern browser is actually an incredibly capable thing. We have a full JavaScript engine and all sorts of capabilities in there. Well, we're doing browser-based rendering, maybe with some progressive enhancement, as you know, we got a bit smarter. Um, and on the server side, uh, hopefully a pattern that looks very familiar to you, sort of controllers talking to a service layer with some repositories. I got a little bit fancy here, and I put some spring integration in with some inbound and outbound channel adapters and things. But you know, essentially, we're, we're sending an HTTP request, we're sending back HTML, and we're talking to a relational database. So first kind of change um, is that some of this sort of presentation and client-side model is moving up into the client. So let's take kind of our controllers, the immediate interaction with the user. Let's take a client-side model. Let's put that inside the client. And now we've got sort of a view. We're going to do some DOM manipulation, etc. Maybe we've got some local client-side web storage. We're going to move that whole piece up and deliver a much richer, closer to the user experience there. We'll still talk over HTTP. Probably we won't send back you know, pre-formatted HTML. We're going to send back data. Here I'm using a JSON format that's going to be interpreted and then you know, rendered in some form perhaps on the client. We may also, in addition, use a WebSocket connection. You know, more about that later on. In addition to sort of client-side initiated communications, there may be cases when we need a server-initiated communication, a push, some kind of asynchronous event or notification delivered out to the client. So that's what's happening sort of above the line. If we now look what, what we've got left below the line, our service layer is now kind of the first line of defense. It's the front line of the service side. And so we can think about you know, how that's going to work and where we're going to deploy it. Traditionally, we deployed these server-side apps to a classic-looking application server. Increasingly, our deployment target will actually be a cloud or a platform as a service, and that can look slightly different. And again, we, you know, we'll, we'll play that out through the night. So we have our service layer. We're going to deploy this on some kind of platform as a service environment. What do we do when we do that? How should that look? And in particular, do we keep it as one monolithic unit? Or are we going to think about breaking it up into a number of smaller services, perhaps? Each one of these things is a unit of deployment. It's a unit of update. It's a unit of scale. Um, and so there's some value in sort of separating it out. And we're going to need to learn to think about what is an appropriate granularity. How do I divide that up? Um, and I kind of, you know, I use as my first rule of thumb, let's look at aggregate entities and see sort of how they play out. But we're going to have a front line um, of services. They could be sort of probably RESTful style APIs, and we're going to sort of drill into that. You know, there might be some WebSocket handling code here. What sits behind these services then? Well, in actual fact, it's just more services. So we're actually on the, on the service side, we have a web of services. We may in turn depend on other application services like worker processes. We might depend on platform services. We may be using as well as relational stores, non-relational stores, etc. We may be calling out to other web APIs. But this is kind of you know, how the, the traditional picture starts to evolve. And so the summary for this part is that you know, we're moving to a world of client-side applications talking to server-side services using HTTP coming in, JSON coming back, server-side push, um, the client side may be based around HTML5 and also native applications. We can't ignore those. Um, talking to cloud or platform as a service style hosted services. OK, I told you we'd go through that a bit quickly. That's the setup. The rest of you know, tonight's talk really now is 
you're going to go through that change top to bottom, starting with you know, the smart clients and ending up with, you know, fingers crossed, some code that's running across a couple of Amazon regions and creating kind of a distributed cloud environment at the back end for you. But let's start at the top and talk about these smart clients. So, let's make a deal. There's a, uh, a game show that ran in the, in the US, some of you may have heard of it, or perhaps for those of you, you know, not from the US, you may know it as the Monty Hall problem. Um, I won't reveal the details of the Monty Hall problem if you haven't heard of it, um, but you can, you can look it up on Wikipedia later on. So we're going to play a game. In this particular game, in the traditional original version of the game show, uh, the contestant is shown three doors. We, tonight we will also have three doors. Um, and in the original version, the idea is that ultimately, as the contestant, you're going to open one of these three doors. You have a free choice. There's a prize behind one of the doors. In the original version, it's a car. Um, otherwise, behind the other doors, are, you know, some kind of booby prizes or something you don't want to win. Tonight, I don't have any cars. Sorry. So, What we are going to do instead is um, you're going to get a chance to ask the spring question of your choice, either to Jürgen Hurler who probably knows the answer, <laughs> or if you're unlucky to a small furry animal who, who is trying to practice the Jürgen pose but hasn't quite got it there, as you can see. <laughs> so the way the game proceeds, um, I present you the doors, you choose a door. When you've chosen a door, the host then opens one of the other doors that you didn't pick. You then get to decide, are you going to stick with your original choice or are you going to switch? It really is very simple. So, should we play a game? Let's move across. There we go. Right, so this is, um, this is a little app. We're going, to, we're going to look at the code for this in a minute. Let's make it this. this is running on Cloud Foundry and we'll see how that's structured in a minute. So here we are. Let's make a deal. Um, somebody give me a door. Pick a door, someone. Three, number three. Four is not a good choice. Number three, I, <laughs> I'm going to take number three. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, the host has opened door number one, revealing a small furry animal. Are you feeling good about your initial choice? Are you confident in number three, or do you want to switch to number two? You won. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, all right, since you're on a lucky streak, let's stop there. So um, that's the Monty Hall client. So how do we build that? What does that actually look like? Uh, so let's, let's just bring up the code. So this is an editor called Scripted. Uh, I'll talk about that in a moment. Is the font big enough for you all? Do you want it one bigger? It's good. Okay. So this is uh, a modern kind of web app. It's a web app, but not like you know it. Um, here's the entire server-side logic. You can pretty much see what's going on here. We're setting up a path. Uh, here we go. Wherever I am plus slash client. And we're setting up, we're using, this is actually node code, and we're using a framework called Express. And we're saying, serve static content from that path. Go. That's my server side. Right, so that looks a little bit different. It's the kind of apps we used to build. So first main point, there really is no server side logic here. It's a different kind of app. So let's have a little look inside the client world. Second thing I want you to take away from this is that, um, in the client side side here, this is a code base. It's not a bunch of sort of templates and JSPs, etc. We're actually looking at a code base here for this particular application. And it's kind of quite well structured. Um, I didn't write it, so I can say that. Um, here we've got um, the main index.html page is what you're going to load. And again, you'll see that basically pretty much after some preamble, we're just going to invoke run.js in the app directory. So let's, let's follow the thread. Next thing I want you to notice, um, there's no server-side logic, this is a code base, there's modularity, there are packages and sort of dependency management in here, we've got a bunch of packages that we depend on, 
There's a structure that's managed all of those. They're all packaged in the libs directory. Um, and when we get down the end, uh, using, using some magic that is curl, that's a library developed by um, Brian Cavalier and John Han, who are in the audience, and on Thursday morning can tell you a load more about how all of this got built and the technology behind it, we're going to wire something called app slash main. So the next thing I want you to notice, there's no server-side logic, this is a code base, it's got modules, packaging, etc. Now we're going to wire it. Remember, this is JavaScript on the client side. I'm not going to try and get you to understand everything that's going on here, but I hope this kind of looks a little bit familiar. There's a couple of views, and you know, they're injected and wired up with a few things. Here's something that should really look familiar. Here's a controller, and it's got some property injection and some references to some other things going on. Um, looks a bit spring-like, doesn't it? You know, we've actually got some dependency injection and wiring going on in a code base on the client. Next thing I want you to notice, um, there's no server-side logic. It's a code base. It's got modularity and packaging. It's got wiring and dependency injection. It's also an extensible container. It's got plugins, a bit like you can extend Spring and enable various other things. So here we've enabled certain kind of wirings. I even notice it's got wire slash AOP. I particularly like that. So it's extensible. It's even got AOP in here. Um, the last thing I just want to show you in kind of this, you know, just pretty, this is a slight, very different world. Um, one of the things we wired in is called click streams. And this is related to that AOP functionality. So if you think about a classic server-side web application, like to capture the click stream, how users are interacting with it, and that's very valuable data. You think about the architecture I just took you through briefly, a lot of those clicks never make it back to the server side anymore, so you've got to capture them on the client side. So if you want to know how people are interacting with your app, you've got to get that information on the client side, package it up, send it back to the server. And we're actually doing this with a library called Clicks, which is written by Scott Andrews. And so we're doing some AOP-style stuff on the client side. Um, and even you can see in here, when we look down in the middle here, what happens? Um, we've got an inbound adapter. We've got um, an outbound adapter. It looks a little bit sort of integration-like. Um, what happens when we've got a chunk stream where we're going to post it back to the server side? In a minute, we'll go server-side server again, and you'll all feel a bit more at home. Um, we've got some interesting stuff happening here. So I really just, you know, this code base, it's all in GitHub, you can stare at it later. I just want you to get a feel for what these kind of things look like. That's the purpose of this section. By the way, the editor I'm using, scripted, um, new JavaScript editor that you know, Andy Clement and the team put out just last week, you know, based on our experiences over the years, first trying to make good tooling for Aspect J and ADDT, and then the Groovy and Grails tooling and the Spring tooling, etc. These guys took all of that knowledge and they made actually a really fast and really quite slick little in-the-browser JavaScript editor. This is really nice to work with, and it's got some pretty good smarts. Um, see if I just hover over some of these places. Let's try and find one. Um, I actually can infer and understand some of the content of the libraries. Let's just see if I can navigate. I can navigate, and in a sub-panel, I can bring up some of the inferred content. And with a following wind, I've even got, um, if I'm happy, yeah, I've got code completions available. So that's pretty smart for JavaScript, where, you know, obviously, as you know, there's no static typing. There's a lot of inferencing and other things going on. You've got all the kind of lint warnings and errors and things captured. So this is a pretty um, nice environment. And you'll see more of that later on. For now, uh, we're good. So that's a little bit about just what a server-side web app looks like these days. Oh, sorry, a single-page app looks like. OK, so we've played the game. Many of those libraries that we use to build that app, as I say, you know, there's a session on Thursday to take you through in much more detail. Um, a package is called Cujo that comes with the curl module loader, the wiring module, there's when for promises, there's an AOP library, clicks, etc. So, you know, what I just wanted to take away is that it doesn't look like a bunch of templates and JSPs. It looks like a code base, and there's starting to be some really sort of quite structured and spring-style things appearing on the client side. Um, but for the rest of the day, we're going back to the service side. And I really want to talk about, you know, next, well, what, what was that single-page app interacting with? What it actually was making was calls to a REST API. And so, you know, the, the front line 
Remember, our service layer has moved up and exposed now to the outside world. The front line is a world of you know, these single-page apps that maybe we download from you know, over a browser, as I just did with that, from Cloud Foundry. Or maybe we download it you know, out of band from an app store or something. Whether it's running in a browser, whether it's a native app, whether it's a native app embedding stuff. It's probably then talking uh, to web APIs, you know, hopefully over a RESTful style, maybe over WebSockets, et cetera, to some code on the back end. So what I want to talk now about is some of the you know, really great advances, and I've just been delighted as I've been working and coding this up over the last few weeks with how smooth this all is now. Um, how you go about doing proper RESTful API design with Spring. Um, as I'm sure most of you are aware, you know, Spring MVC is the foundation for what we do in terms of you know, supporting REST style APIs. And there's a project called Spring Data REST that you may have heard about this week that will actually you know, take some of these new sort of repositories, et cetera, and easily expose them in a CRUD style manner over you know, a basic um, REST format. But beyond and underpinning that is a library called Spring HATOAS. Um, Hypermedia is the engine of application state. You know, when, you, when you do a say proper, a full REST API, you want to think not just about the, the, you know, the status, the state that you return, but also very much about the links that are coming back and using those links to discover what's valid and where to go next and to actually use it to navigate through the structure. And that's what this new Spring Library does. And it has some really, really lovely approaches to building those links between the various resource representations and helping you assemble them. And so what does the REST API look like for this particular game? Um, well, just to show you, you know, what we want to code up, um, we'll initiate a game by posting to slash games. And what we expect to get back is, you know, in the good case, a 201 created and a location header telling us the location of the game entity that we just created. If we were to get that game, we'd see its status. In this case, we've just started a game, so it's awaiting your initial selection. What door do you want? And we see a bunch of links. This is how we can start to navigate. So if you want to know where are the doors, here's a doors relationship and the link you follow to find them. If we got doors, we'd actually find some nested structure containing, since we know there are always three fixed doors, the nested doors information. And again, a bunch of links. To change the state of a door to make our selection, we're going to do a patch, or actually in this case a put, to games ID slash doors ID um, with the desired status. And all being well, we'll get back a 200 OK. We might get some other codes. Um, that's the basic flow of our REST API. Fairly straightforward. We'll look at the code in just a moment. Let's just talk briefly about the structure of the code. There is a, you know, a familiar at MVC controller that's the main entry point. And it's working with sort of a few sort of stereotypes at the back end. We have what's called a resource assembler, whose job it is to take a given domain object, for example, a game or a door, and turn that into its representation that's going to be sent back over the wire, which we call a resource. Um, and then that resource, you know, through the, through the Spring Hatos library, we understand things like it should have a link to itself, and there's some nice ways of building the other sort of cross-linking that you see. So that's the main pattern we're going to see when we look in the code base. Um, it's also something here called a cause handler. Cause is the cross-origin resource sharing, and it's the thing that says, well, you know that client that you just downloaded? It didn't actually come from the same hosted domain as this REST API. Normally, the browsers won't allow that, and there's a little sort of dance you have to do. It's quite an intricate dance, it turns out, um, in order to get the various browsers and servers to actually say, OK, you can talk to each other. And that's called cause, and it's something you'd probably want to look into if you're exposing a you know, a generic REST API for clients from various locations to invoke. So that's our pattern. Uh, let's get into the code. Uh, so this code is Java code, so we're going to fire that up in STS. Where to begin? Uh, when, I, you know, when I write this kind of thing, I have sort of a couple of starting points. I want to start out by designing the RESTful API. And then I think about, for me personally, I think about the controller, and I start to sketch that out, and I think about the domain model. And then from those two sketches, I kind of work and fill in the gaps in between. So here's our controller. Hopefully this looks fairly familiar. So we're mapping to slash games. And the first thing you see here is, remember we said we're going to post to slash games. Let's get that hover out of the way. Um, we'll create a new game. We'll store it in our repository. 
and then here, header set location. Remember we've got a location string with it back. Link to, that's from the split, that's a static import from the, the HATOS library. Link to the game controller. So it automatically it's just going to know how to make the right prefixes. Slash game is going to know to extract the ID and put that in the, in the URI and then turn that into a URI and return it. Okay, so that's how we're going to deal with the post. Let's just find the good old terminal. So while we're playing with toys, um, here's another toy that we have coming up. This is what John Brisbane's been working on. This is an absolute delight to work with when you're building a, um, a REST API. And this is called the REST shell. I'm just going to tell it that I want to play with JSON. Okay. Right, now I'm going to tell it my base URI. And we are pointing at a Spring app that's hosted on Cloud Foundry. And slash games. Okay, so what I can now do, for example, is ask it to post to that URL and follow the return link. 405, not allowed. Oh, let's try that again. All right, whatever I do, so we've, um, we've posted to that. I don't know why I couldn't follow it, but I'll do it in a minute. So you can actually see, what I wanted you to see is the return value. Um, we've got our header, location, it's been pre-filled in. There's also a header in here called access control allow origin star. That's all to do with cores. I'll show you in the code base shortly um, where that comes from. Let's see if you'll now be kind to me and let me follow that link. All right, so we're in. So if I get it, yeah, now see, here's the, here's the JSON structure that we were talking about. Um, one very nice thing that um, the REST shell also has is I can list very nicely, discover the link structure and I can list it. It works like a directory. I can go up and down and have lots of fun. Uh, so I can, from here, I could follow doors, for example, and get the doors. Okay, as we were. So we were over here. So we just did the post. Um, you saw, I did a get as well. So the get's going to come in here. Get of a slash ID, this code should be fairly familiar to you. We're going to grab the game from the repository, and then we're going to create a game resource. So in this dot game resource assembler, look over here, to resource from the game. So this is that assembly pattern that I was talking about. Let's, um, let's go and have a peek at that. So what does a game resource assembler look like? So it's extending a class from the Spring Hatos library resource assembler support. When I construct it, I tell it, this is your controller and this is your domain object, or the object, the representation object, so it knows how to make the links. Then I'm just going to fill in the to resource method. Given a game, given a domain object, go create me a resource. That's a superclass method that's going to create the links element and put a link to self inside it. Put inside the status, that's my one piece of sort of domain state I want to send back. And here again we see actually using um, the lovely link builder, creating links to game controller slash, and then I've got slash doors, slash history, slash clicks, with various rel names. And so that's how that little pattern sits together and lets me ever so sweetly build up what I actually want to send back. Okay, so that's that piece of the puzzle. Uh, okay, so we're back in here, we're back in doors. Uh, let's go to... What sure did you pick? You picked door three, didn't you? So let's, let's play again and follow, let's follow, click, follow door three. I get door three. And now I want to actually do a put. So let's see if we can do that. Now puts are a bit more interesting. Because when we do the other kind of things, um, let's just flip back to here. When we do the other kind of things, they're called simple cause requests. When I do a put, it's more complicated. There's something that goes on in cores called a pre-flight check. And it looks a bit like this. This is a capture of some of the earlier testing we did. So what will happen is that your browser will actually say, uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to put to this particular, especially as I've come from a different origin. And let me check. And it sends what's called an options check, a pre-flight check. So it sends the options method. And then the URL that you want to access, it'll say, you know, the verb, that you, the request methods, that's the access control request methods. So I want to do a put, and my origin is, in this case, I'm the montyhallclient.cloudfoundry.com. 
And what comes back, you know, ideally is a 200 OK with a bunch of access control headers saying, all right, I allow access from anywhere. You can use these methods. In this case, I'm saying get, put, and post. If you ask for any special headers, we've got to say, okay, you can use those headers. We also had to say that we're fine exposing the location header so you can actually get access to the resource you just created, et cetera. Um, this is called the pre-flight check. And this actually happens before we do a put. Um, sorry, our put was sitting around in the background there. So we've done a put, and you can see that the status is now selected and unknown. Um, so you know, we're busy by playing our game. I can go up. I can go up and down. Um, if I get that now, I can see, OK, so the host opened door one in this case, the small furry animal. Um, and I might decide to follow two. Got history here, so let's just grab that. Now we're going to put this into the open state. And that will just sort of, uh, let's do, let's run our way back up. Uh, history go number two. Get. Oh, we lost this time. But just see how sweet this REST shell is for interacting and navigating and exploring a REST API. And when you're testing, I can see all the headers, I can see the data. It's been a beautiful thing. Um, it's kind of an aside to our story, but I certainly wanted to show that off. So how did we implement that cause stuff? How did that, how did that actually happen? Um, OK, if we look in our web configuration, we've got one interceptor registered. You won't be surprised to know that that's a cause interceptor. Now, when you're handling um, you know, these pre-flight requests, the other thing to know is that Obviously, it's an options request, which normally, you may not know this, a dispatcher server it just handles that for you. So there's one extra piece of configuration. Because I was targeting Tomcat 6, it's in WebXML, sorry for that. Uh, but dispatch options request true. You know, Spring never, you know, never tries to make you hit a wall. So we can get in and we can actually do it properly. We can design our REST API, we can handle the options, we can say what we want. So saying, I'm going to take control of the options request, thank you very much. And if I came back to my controller, down the very bottom, you know, here's actually my, my handler method for the options requests. But the key thing you really want to see is that little interceptor. And again, you know, to, something to say about cores that we learned in the process of building this is that you know, it's still a little bit kind of emerging technology. You've got to get the, just the right headers in just the right way for just the right browsers to kind of massage it all through. A bit like WebSockets in that respect, but you know, it's definitely the way things are going. So here's our cause handler. And in the pre-handle, basically we're looking to see, is it an options request? Have you asked for um, access control allow origin? And if it passes those tests, we say, all right, this is a pre-flight check. So we will set our various headers, what methods we allow, et cetera, letting you access the location. And we return here false from our interceptor. That basically tells the, the rest of the spring machinery, we're done with this request. I've handled it. Don't carry on any more processing. Otherwise, you know, we're just going to add the header saying, yep, you can access the location, and we return true, which means that we're still going to get our access control allow origin headers where we want them, but we're going to carry on and go to our controller and do the normal logic. So that's a, a whirlwind tour of actually some of what it takes to build you know, a, a decent modern REST API with Spring. What I really love about it is, you know, I, I love that HATOS support. The link builder is very sweet. The whole sort of structure of the resource assembly and the resource. Um, but the fact that you can get in and you can do it, quotes, properly. You know, we can have a, you know, a hypermedia linked API. We can handle the options processing. We can do the pre-flight checks. Um, Spring is a great place to build a good REST API. And the REST shell is also you know, a lovely, lovely tool for doing that. I've got you know, all the code, but I know I'm going through a lot of code very quickly. All the code you're seeing tonight is in GitHub. I've got links at the end of the presentation. So you know, if you see something that really piques your interest, you can, you can go download it and clone it later. There's also a link to scripted and to the REST shell, et cetera. OK, so that was a little look at the front line. We've seen a single page app. We've seen how to build a really nice RESTful API and some of the support for that. Let's keep drilling down. Um, remember that we've got on our service side this web of services, some frontline services. We haven't touched on WebSockets, but that's coming later. Don't worry. Some frontline services. Um, 
and behind that some other services, particularly maybe the classic kind of worker pattern where, in our example, we were gathering a click stream about how you interacted with the Monty Hall app. The reason that we want to do that, by the way, is that um, that is a famous puzzle because it, it's counterintuitive to many people how to play the game. So actually, you're twice as likely to win if you always switch doors from your initial choice as if you stick with your first guess. Whereas it seems intuitive to many people that you've got an equal chance whatever you do. It's actually not the case. And it's pretty fascinating, the whole history of how that was gradually proved out. And anyway, so we want to analyze how you interact with it and how long you hover and what you decide. And we're going to create these click streams and we're going to send them to a queue. And then behind the queue, we're going to have workers that process it and analyze it and give us some stats on how you play the game. That's the setup. So, how do we do this whole workers processing a queue thing? It's actually not even that straightforward with a single worker. So what we've got is a process of processes putting messages in a queue. Hopefully you're with me so far. And that queue is doing you know, a couple of things. It's buffering up, so we've got some kind of flexibility in the system. It's giving us temporal decoupling. And let's start with a worker. We've got a worker that's pulling messages off of the queue. What are some of the things we want to think about? Well, definitely bandwidth, and in this case, what we care about is, you know, how long does it take for the worker to trundle over to the queue, pick up some messages, and bring them back again? How long does that little process take? That's going to matter, because we also got to balance that off against how long it takes to process an individual message. So bandwidth is a factor. Throughput is another factor. So we want to think about, you know, as we think about sort of what's coming in the system, how many messages a second can we process? How much stuff can we get through the pipes? Um, but throughput actually isn't enough, because we also need to think about latency. You know, maybe we've got lots of workers, and so there are many messages coming through the queue, but maybe there's always a, a fixed depth of 15, 15 messages bundled up in that queue. So the latency, the time for servicing any one message, getting it through might still be quite long, even though the throughput's high. So we've got to worry about bandwidth, we've got to worry about throughput, we've got to worry about latency. This is just for one worker. And so really, for, for tuning all this up, we've got two basic controls. We've got what's known as the prefetch size. The prefetch size is all about, remember my worker, my worker goes over here to pick up a message or messages, works when it's back, brings it back again. How many messages does he get each time? If it takes me a long time, do this. And I just get the one little message, and I bring it back again, and I process it really quickly. And it takes me a long time to go and get the next message. Bring it back. <laughs> process that one. I'm basically spending all the damn time walking up and down like this. And not a lot of time actually processing messages. And I'd be far better off, get a bigger shovel, come here, to get a lot of messages at once, bring them back, process, 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 and then go and get some more. And actually, I can tune that prefetch size to make that as efficient as possible. And so that's one of the things we re that's one of our important bells, is the prefetch size. Second control we've basically got is how many workers are pulling on the queue. And between those two things, we can be able to get this system balanced. So we can start thinking about how we scale our workers. So there's a setting. We're going to use you know, MQP and RabbitMQ, and there's a setting called you know, quality of service prefetch that we can use to tune how big, our, how big our shovel is when we go get some messages. Um, and roughly, in a constant state, we want to set that so that the total round trip time, how long it takes me to go over there, get the messages and come back and process them, divided by the processing time of an individual message, that's about how many we should get. And that would maximize um, how efficient we are in managing the bandwidth. And that works great, of course, if all our messages have a pretty constant processing time and we're on a network with pretty constant behavior. Sometimes that's true, sometimes that isn't true. Maybe we're in a cloud and we've got sort of nosy, not, no, not nosy neighbor, noisy neighbors. Maybe they're nosy as well, we don't want that, but they're noisy neighbors. Um, then things get a little more unpredictable. There are algorithms, for example, the control delay algorithm that's been applied down at the TCP layer of the stack that there are in the, in the um, MQP Java client that the Rabbit team have done. They've experimented with putting that into the MQP client that'll actually dynamically adjust itself for this. But we want to think about the prefetch setting, and you know, consider our particular workload and set that appropriately. And then we want to think about how many workers. In a perfectly tuned system, we'd actually be maintaining an empty queue. 
such that whenever a message arrives, there's immediately a worker available to dispatch it to. We just shovel them through as fast as we can. We don't want to have all the hassle of going and putting them on a disk or you know, storing them around and booting them up in memory, etc. We just want to pass them straight through. So you say a perfectly tuned system would keep the queue empty and the workers fully busy. That would be absolutely beautifully balanced. But there are many factors to how you might want to think about how many workers to run, including perhaps cost, if you're you know, paying per usage, etc. So it's really hard to do a kind of one-size-fits-all auto-scaling magical solution. But that doesn't mean you can't automate worker scaling for your particular use case. Um, some of the factors you might want to think about, maybe mi you know, maximum number of workers, what's the most I'm prepared to run? Ten, I don't know, whatever it is. Minimum number of workers. What's the, what's the smallest amount that I want to keep on standby? Uh, typical values would either be zero or one for that, I guess. Um, once I've started a worker, you might want to think about, well, what's the least amount of time I'm going to let it run for? Either a time interval or maybe, depending on where you're doing this, it might be a billing unit. You know, some clouds, once you've started, you, you've charged for X many minutes anyway. So why not just let it run? Q high watermark, that seems fairly obvious. If my Q starts to build up beyond a certain depth, I probably need more workers. It initially seems intuitive. You'd have a Q low watermark and say if it drops below that, I can get rid of workers. But remember, our perfectly tuned system has no messages in the Q and they keep coming through. So low watermark isn't actually very useful. Instead, what we can actually do is look at something called the capacity high watermark. That is, if I had a message right now, how many consumers, how many workers would be immediately available for me to pass it to? And if there are you know, too many immediately available workers all the time, you can infer we've got too many workers. Um, so you could have a capacity high watermark, but you might actually say, well, if there's more than one available worker at any time, we've got too many workers, so you might even not need that. Sample period, how often am I going to monitor the system and take potential values? We better have some kind of damping, you know, how many consecutive samples have to be above my watermarks before I take action. And based on your particular app and your particular workload, um, these are some of the factors that might be involved in automating your worker processes. So I thought it would be fun to have a go at this. So we've got some code that you know, fires all this up for you. So we're going to see um, a number of different applications collaborating. There's a producer application. Uh, the producer basically spits out one message every second. And it's going to publish that um, to an exchange. So if those of you who aren't familiar with AMQP, here is the one sentence introduction. Messages are published to exchanges where they get routed to queues and from there are accessed by consumers. There you are. You learn AMQP as a bonus. So we're going to publish messages to a work exchange. There will be a queue bound to that exchange. It's our work queue. One message per second, remember. There are worker processes that pull messages from the queue. They take three seconds to process each message. So if you do the math for a second. Ideally, we'd be quite well balanced if we had one producer and three workers, right? One message a second, each one takes three seconds. There is also, you're going to see an auto-scaling process. The auto-scaler is monitoring the queue, and it's looking at those two numbers we talked about. How many messages are there, and how many consumers are available right now? And it'll sample those values on some interval. And if it decides it wants to do something, it's going to either add or remove worker processes. How does it do that? It does it actually by using the Cloud Foundry Cloud Controller. So there's a little, very simple Java API, I'll show you in a minute, for adding and removing these processes. So that we can see what's going on, there's more. So the autoscaler also takes all that monitoring data it's gathering. They're just beans on fixed polars. Um, and it also publishes it to a separate topic exchange called the Monitoring Exchange, having converted it into JSON along the way. Attached to the Monitoring Exchange, so we can see what's going on, is a component called the WebSocket Relay. What that does is when a browser comes in, it creates a private queue on behalf of that browser, such that anything published to our topic exchange gets routed back out to the browser over WebSockets, um, so that browsers can basically participate in this messaging fabric. Okay, so that's, um, that's my five apps that comprise this world. And I'm going to show you this in action, show you some of the code. Uh, to show you the code, as it is running on Cloud Foundry, uh, we need to be able to run quite a number of processes. For those of you that have dabbled with Cloud Foundry, you'll know that normally there are limits on that kind of thing. Uh, but 
Uh, where are we going? We're going over here. Let's quit that. I know something you don't know. So I'm just changing my, um, my VMC target from the, the running cloudfoundry.com to another staging system that we have internally um, VMware. So Cloud Foundry is actually getting much, much closer now to its commercial availability. And I'm going to now sort of connect to you know, a staging system, an early system for the you know, soon to come commercially available version of Cloud Foundry. It's got some pretty nice things in it. Um, I'm not allowed to announce it, but I am allowed to show you some of the things that are coming. Um, so this is a non-announcement of some things that are coming um, in the forthcoming Cloud Foundry. <laughs> so for example, there's a portal. Um, so now we can actually start to interact with it. So here you can see, you know, I'm in, I'm a user. Um, I can, let's just wake this up. Hey, right, we're alive. Um, so I'm, I'm inside here, and you can see something called an organization. So some, some new structures that have arrived are organizations where I can associate users with an organization. And within an organization, I can create one or more spaces. And a space is a pretty cool concept. It lets me share a collection of applications and services amongst a number of users. So we don't all have to create some account and you know, pass the password around. So a space is a pretty nice notion. Uh, let's just go back home. So if I look inside my space that I've created, dun, 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 um, here I can see, for example, my various apps. And I've got my worker broker, you know, Rabbit MQ service under there. And I've just got one running so far. Remember the, um, the apps we talked about? There's the autoscaler, there's the producer, there's the worker process, there's the relay. And there's also another single page app that this bootstraps this whole WebSocket connection for the monitoring data. And I can actually go in and look at um, one of these as well, and I can edit it and see its details, etc. Um, so that's a little look at, you know, a look at the non-announced forthcoming availability of the commercial edition at Cloud Foundry. Um, but most importantly, for our purposes, we can get increased quotas, you know, we can sign up for improved service plans, etc. Um, and I'm on one of those. So. Now with my new and improved Cloud Foundry, I say, what applications have I got? Um, and you can see that all these processes we talked about, the autoscaler, the producer, the monitor, et cetera, are all sat there. Uh, where should we go next? Um, so let me, let me show you briefly what the worker monitor looks like. Here we are again. So this is pretty small. Uh, you recognize this structure by now. It's a single page app. And so there's my no server side server side that basically bootstraps the client. When this loads, I, this is the thing I want you to notice here is that I'm using SockJs, a library developed uh, in, by some of the guys in our Rabbit team over in London. Um, this is going to let me do the WebSocket connection very nicely from the browser. So you see here I'm making a socket connection back to ws-relay, that's the app URL that I've bound my you know, little relay to um, over at P02, which is our staging system. And whenever that gets a message, you can see three little charts, lovely charts. Um, we're going to pull the data out and we're going to update both the text and the chart so you can see what's going on. Remember, this is going to be subscribed to a topic exchange. So that's piece one. That is pretty much all of interest in that code. So let's go back. Web sockets. Um, let's type. Right. Web sockets. So this is the WS relay piece, right? So again, there's, there's a school of thought that says you probably want to handle your WebSocket connections perhaps in a different process to your regular web app connections, they have quite a different nature. One of the things about the new world is, as you've already seen, I've got a lot of different processes and apps. I can match and max, I can use the best tool for the job. Here I don't need much. I've got a tiny little node app. Uh, so I'm creating a, I'm using the MQP library, create a connection to my broker. Just like with Spring, you know, this is configured with details for a local broker, but when it's pushed to Cloud Foundry, as a single page app, uh, sorry, as a standalone app or a node app, it's going to actually replace this with the details for my actual broker up in my cloud account. Um, so I create a connection. I establish that I want to install my um, 
SockJ's handler inside my HTTP server. And then here's it. When the MQP connection is ready, go do this. Start listening for incoming browser connections. When I get a connection, create a private queue on behalf of that browser, bind it to the monitoring exchange, and then start subscribing for messages. And I'm just going to um, A, write them to the console so I can see them go by, and then they're going to send all the messages I receive from the topic exchange out to the browser. Job done. What are we? 48 lines of code. Nice and simple. That's my WebSocket relay. OK. All the code is in GitHub if you want to stare at it later. So, uh, where should we go next? Let's go next back to STS. Just to show you uh, the other half of the picture. So, we're in the, uh, do you really want to see the, the producer, for example? This is the main entry class for the producer. So all of my projects create static executable jar files. Um, and I deploy them, because they're not web apps. I'm going to deploy them as standalone applications on Cloud Foundry, which is another new feature that Cloud Foundry has introduced over the previous few months. And so I've got a little test here um, using the Cloud Environment, which is a class provided by the Cloud Foundry runtime library. And there's a little test. Am I in Cloud Foundry? And um, I care about that, because when you see my configuration, what I'm actually then going to do is set the cloud profile. Now, as you've seen, the environment profiles is where I'm going to set the cloud profile active. And that will actually tell the Cloud Foundry machinery to go and dependency inject my RabbitMQ connection, for example, into my app. And the rest of it is a standard spring bootstrapping. So you have that little piece there. And then um, it's no rocket science. Right? There's a little bean that creates this called by spring integration. It creates a work package and pushes it on a queue says this is message number whatever. So I'll go and I'll show you quickly. We'll look at one of these. We won't look at them every time. So here is my declaration. So there's a Beam message producer. You just saw the class. There's a spring integration inbound channel adapter that is going to call that method. You just saw a create work package and push the results to the two worker exchange channel, which down here is configured to put the message on the AMQP worker exchange. And there'll be a queue bound to that that we'll see in the subscriber to consume the messages. OK, so the last thing of interest before we actually fire all this up is let's look at the actual autoscaler. That's probably the thing that most people are interested in. We've done the theory. How could we, in theory, autoscale? How do you actually implement this? Uh, let's start with the blueprint. When I write these kind of apps, by the way, actually, the way I do it, I always start with the blueprint, pretty much. So the first thing I sit down and write is this file that says, this is, a, this is how I want to lay out my app. Then I go back and fill in the beans and the code. So I've got a couple of beans. I've got a queue monitor bean, and I've got a worker monitor bean. They are responsible for finding out the queue depth and the number of available consumers and, of course, the number of worker processes. And I've got a couple of inbound channel adapters they're going to invoke those once a second and put their results onto a, an exchange. There's an autoscaler bean. You may recall some of these parameters. Max workers, min workers, Q high watermark, consumer high watermark. A little bit of damping. You know, for example, once we've started or stopped a worker, how many seconds are we going to wait before we take another action? Um, and a reference to a process manager. Uh, there are some outbound channel adapters that basically take the messages produced by those monitors and push them into the methods on Q stats and on worker stats in my bean. Uh, let's, let's stay here while we're here. Remember that I also converted it into JSON to publish it to the monitoring exchange to feed it out to the browser. I do that right here. You know, sometimes it's just as easy to do it in line inside the Spring integration file. I'm using the expression language just to take, in this case, the Q stats and make a little JSON expression that I'm then going to pass on down the line and they get pushed here onto the monitoring exchange. Right, so, A lot of stuff flashing by, but it's actually fairly straightforward. Um, and here you can see, if you haven't seen them before, my profiles. So when I'm running standalone, I've got like a mock process manager. But when I'm in the cloud, um, I'll set an environment. I'll grab my Cloud Foundry target URL, my email and password from the system environment. And I'll actually use what's called the VCAP process manager. So that's the, that's the setup. 
only two bits of code, maybe two or three bits of code. How do we monitor the queue? Uh, we use, from the marvelous Spring MQP project, the Rabbit template. And we do something called a queue declare passive. That just says, tell me about this queue, but don't actually go and declare it. So assuming it's there, what we get back is an object that tells us here you see the message count and the consumer count. That's our key information to make the algorithms work. And finally, let's look at the autoscaler itself. There's actually nothing really surprising about most of this code now. So here's our on queue stats method. Remember, it's going to record a sample for our stats or our consumers. And if more workers are required, we scale up. And if less workers are required, we scale down. And it also, in this case, we'll look and see if we've got less than our minimum number of workers, we better start one. Uh, scaling up and scale down simply delegates to that injected bean. Uh, so the, the process manager. That's the very last thing I'll show you before we run it. How easy is it in Cloud Foundry to actually start to interact with some of the system? Very easy. So my VCAP process manager bean, um, which we constructed with passing in the target URL, the username and the password. What we're going to do is make some credentials and log in. And then um, when we want to add a worker process, we're just going to call the CFOps update application instances, my app name, one more worker than I've currently got. So the API you can see is actually really quite small. And when we destroy it, we'll log out. All right, enough. You may or may not be desperate to see this in action, but you're going to anyway. Um, so that, that's all the various processes. There are five different processes. You saw them all running in my account. Um, so this is, this is the one demo where I can kind of relax a bit more. Because actually, I'm going to now show you this recorded, because I'm doing it at twice real speed. It takes a while for the system to settle down. So you can see, maybe you see at the bottom there, just showing you the apps in my account. I'm starting up the WebSocket Relay application. You can see it's established a connection to Rabbit. Now it's waiting for a browser connection. Grab the URL that my worker monitor is set at. Well, hey, gauges. Everybody loves a good gauge. I've got three gauges. You can see the number of messages in the queue. You can see the number of ready consumers. You can see the number of active workers. And you can see in the little console at the bottom there, we've established our WebSocket connection. I start the autoscaler. Data starts flowing over that topic exchange. We also got a worker process started because we said min workers was one. Now we're sitting there. Let's start a producer. Remember, the producer banging out one message every second. A worker takes three seconds to eat the message. So what we should expect to see is that the number of messages, the backlog, is slowly growing. It's gone out of the green zone. That was our threshold. We just started another worker process. If we do VMC apps, you'll see there are now two instances of that. The message backlog is still going up. We're not quite processing fast enough, but it's going up slower. Uh, oh, we started another worker. OK. If we were in a good position, the system would now be stable, right? The workers are enough. But the queue is still quite high, so the latency is still too high. We've got you know, too much of a backlog in the queue. We want to bring that down. Let's have another worker. We're up to four. We're up to five. Now we're going to start bringing the queue down fairly quickly. Choo, 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 choo. Back in the green zone, things are looking good. All right, no queue backlog. So now messages coming in are being shoveled straight to an available worker. And in fact, we've drained the queue. We've got too many available workers now. We've got more than we actually need. And so with two available consumers, the algorithm look at that. It'll drop it down, back down to three workers now. And actually, this is a stable state. So the number of available consumers will flip between 0 and 1, depending on the timing. But the system will stay here now. It's tuned itself. It's happy. Um, of course, I meddled with it and stopped the producer. So now there are no more messages coming in. We'll see there are instantly a number of available ready consumers. We start dropping down the number of workers, back down to only two workers. Still a few too many consumers available. So in just a moment, right, we'll drop back down. We're now at actually our, our second stable state, because we said minimum workers was one. There are no messages. There's one consumer available. There's one worker. And so with my five apps, with a little bit of Node, a single page app, some WebSockets magic, and most particularly this auto-scaling algorithm that depends solely on things you can get from any AMQP connection. So you don't need anything special about the broker here. So I don't need the Rabbit MQ management plugin or anything else. You can do this in Cloud Foundry or anywhere you can get hold of a Rabbit broker. You can actually efficiently and effectively scale your processes. Um, and so that, that's a, a pretty nice little way of doing it. Um, 
So that's the worker monitoring piece. But, you know, let's do more. So that was kind of fun. And actually, I found out that people really love my little gauges and the dials bouncing around, etc. And now it's getting popular. And people all around the world want to see this data. Um, maybe I need to do some geo load balancing. So I'm going to actually make, take you to the closest you know, available region where I've got some kind of data center. Or perhaps you, know, you just have a need to create, perhaps you've got more than one data center in your organization and you want to create a shared global publish and subscribe environment across those data centers and perhaps also to a cloud. Or maybe this is you know, some Amazon region or availability zone and a different Amazon region or availability zone. Whatever you've got processing happening in various locations, you want to be able to publish anywhere and subscribe anywhere. How do you do it? Well, the first thing we're going to think about is we're going to place a local broker inside each cloud location so that all of my applications just think and act like they're talking to a local broker. And all of the difficulties of handling those wide area network connections, we're going to leave to the broker itself. That's my first key decision. And we're going to use something, um, rather MQ feature, called a federated exchange. Now, the way the federated exchange works is that basically in my, in my broker, I can declare an exchange, and there are various types in MQP. There are topic exchanges, we've seen them, and direct exchanges, and fan out exchanges. This is a federated exchange, and a federated exchange says, as well as getting things that are published locally, I actually also get messages from someone else. Something that's called the upstream exchange. You think about a stream, things that are plopped in upstream, they flow downstream, and the federated exchange sees them. So basically, I've got a pointer back to an exchange in another, um, in this case, another data center, another broker. When I cluster brokers inside one cloud, that's a local area network connection, and we're actually using Erlang OTP. When I do this, it's a WAN connection. I really don't want to be using Erlang over that. So we're using AMQP to make the federated link, which is great because I can use AMQPS and I can encrypt it. So we've got sort of WAN awareness with all the buffering, etc. We've got potential encryption on the link. And we've got a way of saying, hey, messages over there, we want them over here too. So that's the federated exchange concept. And what I can do with that is I can start to make topologies that say, OK, these brokers are connected up and messages flow in this, you know, flow around the circle. So here I've done an you know, all to all topology. But you can actually set this up in many different ways. You can have rings, etc. And the messages can flow around the federation setup. And so what I can actually able to do, I say, is you know, publish messages in one, say, Amazon region and receive them in another Amazon region and vice versa, all without. You know, the spring code that I'm going to write to do it, really being aware at all of this federation. So we're starting to get into kind of multi-cloud or data center and cloud scenarios. So let's have a look at how we do that. Uh, let's go back over here. I'm just going to have a little tidy up. Excuse me. Wakey, wakey eclipse. All right, so we're going to try and create this global sort of publish and subscribe scenario. Uh, let's have a look. So, in no particular order, this is my publisher. I'm going to invoke this on a fixed schedule, once a second. It seems to be popular this week. Um, and when it creates a message, it's just going to print out this region name. We're, going to, we're actually going to run two regions. We're going to do this um, in US East, Amazon USD, so it's going to be in North Virginia, and we're going to do it in Ireland, the EU West. Um, fingers crossed. So we're going to print out what region we're in and that we're publishing a message. That's all my publisher does, and we call that on a schedule. And you won't be at all surprised to see what the subscriber does. It's got an on message that prints out what it's just received. So with many of these little standalone applications that I'm going to deploy, all the magic is actually in Spring Integration and in Spring AMQP. This is where the, the fun stuff happens. So there's my connection to Rabbit. Um, I'm going to declare a federated exchange for doing global pub sub. So, Rabbit, federated exchange. I'm going to call it the global exchange because I'm going to use this to broadcast messages globally. It's backed by a topic exchange. I'm going to use topic style messaging pub sub here. My upstream set, that's something I have to declare actually in the broker. Right now I have to declare that in the broker up front. I'll show you it in a minute. Um, but in the forthcoming Rabbit 3, even that can be done dynamically, which will be really cool. Uh, so we've got an upstream set which is global. In this case, the brokers know that's 
everybody. And I bound a private queue to it. Now, I've been lazy, and I've got one application I've created that can be either the subscriber or the publisher. Um, so if you're the subscribing half, I'm going to activate the subscriber profile, um, which creates that subscriber bean you just saw, tells it what region it's in, and starts subscribing to messages from that private queue. You fire this thing up with the publisher profile active, you'll get a publisher. Um, and that's going to, on a little polar, call my producer bean and create messages. So basically, I've got one little app that I can make either a publisher or a subscriber. And I'm going to connect that up to Amazon US East and to EU West. Not complicated at all. Right. Where should we go next? Let me show you some of the setup. Uh, so that's in here. So here we are in the Amazon console. So just to show you what's happening. You're all tweeting a lot, aren't you? The network's really slow. I'll take that as a good thing. Right, so we're looking at my instances. Let's just try and refresh this. And I see I've got one instance in Amazon e US East. Um, it's got an elastic IP. I can scroll up and show you that. So I've given it a fixed IP address so I know how to talk to it. Um, I'm going to ignore that loading bar and just carry on and see if it works. I've also got exactly the same thing set up in Amazon EU West, where there's another, another instance with my Rabbit broker. There it is. Um, which has also got an elastic IP. So you can see those addresses. So those are my two brokers, and they've got a security profile set up so I can talk to them. So, uh, next piece, let's clear this. So let's fire this up. Uh, so this is TMUX. So if you haven't seen TMUX, it just gives me four console windows in one hit, uh, all preset to run what I want to run. So I've built my jar file. In the top left-hand window, I'm going to point at uh, my Amazon Elastic IP for US East. So this is going to be a US East window, and it's going to behave as a publisher. And I'm piping it into Colorize uh, just to give you some pretty colors in the console. It's a console demo, but at least you get color. All right, so we can see that um, we're publishing messages in US East. I hope to goodness, if I come down here, this is also set up to be... Amazon US East, but I'm going to activate the subscriber profile. Hey, a slight pause. Right, so now we're connected to US East as a subscriber, and exactly what you'd expect to happen is we can see messages that have been locally published. Woohoo. All right. Uh, if we come down here, this is also a subscriber window. Uh, so you see, I'm in the bottom right hand corner. I'm going to be a subscriber but I'm connecting to my EU West, so I'm connecting to Ireland. Um, what I want to happen, you saw from the app that there's really nothing in the code that knows about this global topology. Fingers crossed, I will start to see, yay, now I feel better, messages that were published in US East are now available, I'm subscribing to them in EU West. I didn't do anything particularly clever in my code, I used a federated exchange. So finally, I bet you can guess what's going to happen now. We're going to be a publisher in Ireland, creating other messages in our topic exchange. Those are the green ones. And we've done it. So we have got um, two different clouds, two different data centers, could be your particular environment. Publishing, subscribing with apps built with Spring integration, ever so simple, Spring MQP. Anybody can publish anywhere, anybody can subscribe anywhere, we can do our geo-load balancing, whatever we like. Um, so that's actually a um, pretty nice little setup. So let me just stop all of this. All right, done. So that was um, how you might create global publish subscribe network and how we can figure, connect all that up with Spring. But let's do more. And we're not done yet. Um, there's another thing that people often talk about. In fact, it was one of the very first poster child use cases for the cloud. For example, this would match the cloud bursting use case. I don't want to replicate everything any, everywhere, but I might want to choose at different points in time where particular workloads get processed. Um, various you know, different ways of playing with this setup. It might be, for example, maybe I've got a SaaS app. 
and I want to at some point move the workload for a particular customer, so a particular key in a topic exchange off to a different environment. Maybe I want to follow the sun, and so I want to have it so that wherever the, you know, the workload is moving, as it goes around the panel, I'm going to put the processing close to it. Maybe I want to follow the moon, so that I'm actually moving the processing to wherever it's cheapest at the point in time. Maybe I want some parts of my system following the sun and some parts following the moon. Somebody might want to follow the stars, I don't know. But anyway, we, could, we want to be able to move stuff around. Um, the classic cloud use case, everybody talked about it, damn hard to do at the application layer. Um, you know, when we say that you want to use sort of lightweight modern middleware that's designed with the cloud in mind, this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about. Um, so what I want to do now is on the left hand side, I'm going to have a broker. Maybe that's your data center, maybe that's in my case it's going to be um, Amazon US East, pretending to be my corporate data center. And let's it sort of suppose that in that data center, your workload is growing up. I've got green workloads and purple workloads. We're scaling up. We're going to do the classic sort of, OK, under load, I want to move things. But I could do it on a scheduled bean or something if I like using the at scheduled annotation. What I'd like to happen is that we'll create a federated link. Workload will slowly drain away from the corporate HQ location and gradually start being picked up in the cloud. That is the canonical classic cloud burst scenario. And when I do this, I want it to be just as smooth as it is in my PowerPoint animation with the great nice draining of the work in one region, ramping up of the work in the other region, nothing lost in between, no messy edges. Um, so that's the, that's the kind of use case that we're driving after here. And the nice thing about this particular kind of style of federation is that, and we're going to rely on this, um, the brokers are smart here. So I can set up federated links, but nothing flows over those federated links unless there's actually a local binding that's going to send it somewhere. So we don't move messages across the WAN for no good reason. So how do we do this? Um, you're going to like this one. Not a lot, but you like it. Partition processing. We're going to start, so I'm going to do order processing. Um, lack of imagination, sorry. So I'm going to do order processing, and I've got a little guy, um, I think it's once a second, that puts orders into an orders exchange. And I'm going to use a feature called the alternate exchange. Now, the alternate exchange is a clever fellow. And he says, well, you know, if you publish a message to this exchange and there's nobody around who can consume it, I'll send it to the alternate exchange instead. That's why it's called the alternate. And so I've got an alternate exchange here, which is called orders exchange local. And actually, I'm going to bind my orders queue to it. And I have my workers that process orders being fed from that queue. So if there are no other bindings in my orders exchange, things will be processed locally. This is my current setup. And then I'm going to declare a couple of other exchanges here. I call one Amazon US West and another one for Amazon EU West. Um, that if I did choose to stop processing locally and maybe process them in one of these other locations, I could actually fire these up. But right now, they're just sat there. Nothing's happening. Meanwhile, over in Ireland, uh, we've got another orders exchange local. It's the same name as the one I had in corporate HQ so that my worker process could be exactly identical. It's got an orders queue bound to it and we'll be able to feed workers from it. Here comes the magic. When I want to do the bursting, what I do is I create what's called an exchange to exchange binding. From my orders exchange over in my corporate HQ to the EU West, there, get my, get my, to the EU West exchange. When that binding's in place, messages will flow into the EU West exchange in my corporate HQ, which will hop over the federated link and pop up in Ireland. Because I've got that link, it means that a message published at the top level, coming in the top of the funnel, does have a routing. So it's no longer going to go to the alternate exchange. I stop going to stop going locally. And if I want to suddenly pull the workload back, all I do is I remove that binding, and now it's flowing back into corporate HQ. So by controlling, it's like a big switch, controlling, like, a, like railway tracks. You know, controlling where I move that, messages are going to flow around the globe, wherever I want them. And what I want to happen is, obviously, when I make that, the workers should slowly drain away in the local region once they've processed all the orders, and they'll ramp up in Ireland. And if we were using some of that automated worker scaling I showed you earlier, we could make that work. One more thing. Sat underneath these... Um, little exchanges that are used for remote shipping. I'm going to bind another couple of queues, um, just so we can keep an audit record of things that we've sent remotely for processing, and so that you can see what I'm doing. So that's the setup. We're going to, no, that's, the, that's the scheme. That's the design pattern for doing kind of message-based cloud bursting. 
Ah, so here we go. So this is the work migration. There are a couple of projects in this when you get to look at the code. Uh, let's see, there are, there are three really simple beans. Right, there's the order capture bean, you get the idea now. It sits on a polar and it says, I've sent an order for processing and it tells you the order number. There's an order processor that says, I'm processing a particular order and it will tell you in what region it's processing it. And remember, if we ship an order remotely, we have got a little auditor that says, all right, I've shipped an order to some region, in this case it's always going to be EU West, for remote processing, so we can audit what's going on. So once again, all the magic and the heavy lifting is done by Spring Integration. And I started with the blueprint when I built it. Okay, so we've got our connection to Rabbit, you're familiar with that one now. Here is my configuration for my corporate data center, my in-house data center, and I called this the HQ profile. I've been lazy again, and I've done HQ and remote in the same app, sorry. So, uh, but it's quite, they can share some common definitions. Here's my HQ, right? So it's got an order capture bean, you just saw it. I call that once a second, and I put the result on the orders exchange. And of course, that's bound, remember the top level of our picture, so that's bound in at the orders exchange. And there's no other binding to that orders exchange at the moment. So here it is. Here's the declaration of the exchange. And it's got an alternate exchange. This is how you set this up, the spring integration. And it's pointing to orders exchange locals. So remember, we're working out that left-hand branch of the picture. Here's orders exchange local, and it's got that orders queue sat on it. That's what we're going to consume from. OK. And then remember, I've got some placeholders for when I want to ship things remotely. These aren't bound in yet. That's the key. A fan out exchange for Amazon EU West. I've only got one remote location in this, with the orders queue hung off the end of it. And right now, there's an order processing bean, here we are, whose location is set to corporate HQ. So we're going to run that in our corporate HQ data center. And we're going to have a little message list, a container, that's listening in to those orders queue and to the remote orders logging queue, so we can see um, our order processing and our remote auditing. That's it for the HQ profile. Further down, we've got my Cloudburst profile. This is what's going to happen over in Ireland. Um, we're going to declare that federated exchange, remember, orders exchange local, who's got an upstream set that points back to my exchange that was in corporate HQ. It's got a queue called orders, and sat on that queue is my order processing bean. Now it's going to say I'm in EU West. Um, and we're going to have a little message list in the container feeding that. That's the setup. So all the magic's really in that alternate exchange and how we manage the bindings. There's a second project in this particular set. Uh, I called it the big switch. The thing you really want to look at in here is the switcher. Gets hold of an AMQP template. We dependency inject that, of course. And you can either set the order processing, lo you can set the order processing location if we're currently in HQ and we want to go remote, I'm sorry, if we're currently remote and we want to go in the HQ, then what we have to do, if you remember the scheme, is remove our exchange bindings. Um, otherwise, if we want to go to the cloud, we have to add that exchange to exchange binding. This is the railway track big switch. And really, that, they're very straightforward. I'm going to use the AMQP template again, do in Rabbit, either an exchange unbind, you see it there, or an exchange bind. So that's the big switch, and that's wired up with a little console. OK, pause for breath. Here we go. Good old Tmux. We have three consoles. On your left-hand side, uh, we have an application that we're going to fire up in what we're going to simulate as HQ, but actually is really running in Amazon US East. And um, we're going to activate the HQ profile. Again, we're going to colorize the output, and let's start that running. OK, so it's sending orders for processing, and of course, they're being processed locally. So this is, our, you know, in our case, it's our normal state. Uh, let's go up here. So over here. I'm connecting to Amazon EU West, so over to Ireland, um, and I'm ready. Of course, no messages are coming to Ireland yet, because I'm all processing them quite happily in my corporate HQ. 
down here, in Amazon US East, of course, because that's where we've got the lever, that's where we place the controls, is the big switch. Where do you want to process your orders? Do you want to do it in your own data center or in the cloud? We've now reduced this down to a type in the console kind of question. So if I say I'd like to process my orders in the cloud, hey, so now we are suddenly in US East, remotely auditing that we're shipping orders away, and we're picking them up in Ireland. When we did that, that was an atomic switch. We didn't drop anything, right? We gently drained what there was in our corporate HQ, and we picked it up in the cloud. You want to go back again? Just flip it. Now we're processing orders in corporate HQ again. It's great fun. I spent hours doing this in the cloud, in the data center. In the cloud. Now, just to show you what's happening here, uh, where am I currently processing them? I'm currently processing them in the cloud. So let's come back over here. I've actually got rabbits set up. Um, let's go to the orders broker virtual host, because that's the one that we're using. Uh, this is US East. So if I look in US East and I look at the exchanges and I look at the orders exchange, you see it's currently got a binding to Amazon EU West. That's why messages are flowing to the cloud. And if I come in here and I say go back to HQ, and when that page refreshes, binding's gone. That's how it's working. I go to the cloud. Binding comes back. Yes, it does. So that, it's ever so simple, but we're just using capabilities of Spring MQP, Spring integration, um, some Rabbit smarts. One thing I haven't shown you, actually just, uh, you might be interested. Let's kill some of this. All right, let's clear all that away. We want to go. We want to go to Europe. Let's just SSH, it, SSH into my EU instance. So here we go. I'm in. Uh, I mentioned there's a config file, the upstream sets. This is what it looks like. Uh, so here, for my two examples, this is a Rabbit MQ configuration now. Declared two upstream sets. Those are the things that were named in my uh, my Spring integration configurations. For this case, we're using the corporate HQ configuration set. That's the second one there. Um, that says I have a connection back to HQ for the exchange, what is exchange Amazon EU West. That connection is simply referenced down here. That my HQ connection is, there's the host name using my Elastic IP address for my US East instance, and please connect on the orders broker virtual host. And the, um, the other setting, the global one, was what we used when we made the global pub sub. Um, so that's the last piece of the puzzle there. Uh, right, where should we go? Let's go back here. Okay, so that's how we actually do for real, without dropping any messages, those kind of scenarios where we go from a data center into the cloud, or we go cross region in the cloud, or we go cross availability zone. And again, when we've been talking about all these years, you, know, you want to be using lightweight modern middleware that's designed with the cloud in mind. This is the kind of stuff we mean. Can your broker do this? It's pretty cool. And in Rabbit 3.0, the whole thing is dynamic. Um, all right, we've done the code walkthrough. So how would you, sort of regression, how would you actually do this now, achieving sort of high availability both within and across availability zones? Um, well, a couple of little pointers. In any given cloud instance or region or data center, et cetera, any place in tonight that you've seen a single broker, that could be a clustered broker. It's going to be clustered using the Erlang mechanisms, um, and you can mirror queues around those clusters. Currently, you can say mirror to all brokers, or you can explicitly list them. Coming very soon, you'll be able to say, you know, keep N redundant copies, which would be really nice. Between clusters, what do you do? You use federation. And then the, you know, the other piece of advice is I would say, always talk to your local broker. So if you know, for example, you're trying to create something that's you know, highly available or at least petition tolerant, don't you know, create a remote connection in your code to the, the remote destination. Talk to a local broker, set up federation or something called the shovel if you prefer, to move the messages remotely for you. What that means is, if the other party goes away, your messages can just back up on a queue. When they come back up, you can process them 
or you can do some of that partition workload moving magic that we've just been looking at to pump them off somewhere else. The key thing is, all of these things I've showed you, the global pub sub and the federated cloud bursting and all the rest of it, I can update the topology without actually changing the core application code, and that's a really powerful feature. All right, so that's some messaging patterns. We better look at some data patterns that go with it. Um, I'm not going to go into those in anything like the same depth we did for messaging. Don't panic. Um, but what if consumers processing those messages need access to, for example, some reference data in order to do their job? Or what if they need to update some data records? But then we've got to think about not just how we move messages around, but how we deal with the data layer as well. As you saw yesterday, you've seen through the conference, there are many, many styles and different approaches to data. There are only really a few core techniques, though, for doing this. We've got caching, which puts a layer in front of your data stores. And then actually at the data store layer itself, we've got replication, which is going to say, OK, for read only or read mostly data, keep copies of it in each one of those data centers or clouds or zones. And we've got partitioning that says, OK, actually, this is frequently updated or it's hot data. We're going to do partitioning by key, and we're going to sort of move processing to the appropriate place. And those are our tools in the tool chest. And depending on the particular stores, et cetera, you've chosen, you can figure this in different ways. So here's an example um, from the vFabric world, actually just setting something up. This is a product called SQL Fire. So SQL Fire is you know, not a NoSQL, but a new SQL database. I just want you to really see the parallel between this and what we did with Rabbit, where we've got several regions. This was a finance example, so we're using London, New York, Tokyo. There is local processing and access to data in each region, and then there's a WAN gateway that federates between them and does the moving. It's the same pattern. The very last thing I'm going to say about this, but just you know, to give you an idea of the, both the familiarity and the nuances, if I wanted to set something like this up, um, when I'm declaring the tables, etc., I can say I've got some extra statements here. So create a flights table, partition it by column. That's going to start creating partitioned tables. Keep n redundant copies. Create a table flight avail availability, also partition it by the column flight ID. But by the way, please co-locate it with the flights table, because when I access one, I often access the other. You need to start giving some hints about where your data should be. The airlines table, create table airlines, replicate it. It's reference data, push it everywhere. So that was a really, really quick, just little pointer for a future talk about really how you know, the data layer needs some of those same kind of things that I've shown you in the messaging space. Summary, we need that. New application architectures, we looked at um, move towards smart clients that are talking to scalable and available services. We saw the increasingly sophisticated client-side code. You saw how to build a, a single page app, or at least you saw a hint into what they might look like. We saw REST and WebSockets, how that Spring is now a fantastic place to build really good, solid RESTful APIs where you can actually build what you want. You're not sort of doing what the framework will expose for you, but you can design it and you can get what you actually want. We looked at some patterns that you can use within a single cloud instance to do worker scaling, et cetera, do WebSocket relaying. We also looked at some patterns for doing some really cool stuff, spanning clouds, making global pub sub environments, doing cloud bursting. The key thing that you saw all the way through, apart from that, you know, the single page app itself, is that we use Spring to do all of that. Spring brought it all together. It was all nicely done in a you know, familiar style. Um, so the, the, as we said yesterday, those principles that we started off many, many years ago we're still applying them, but we're taking them into the, you know, the totally brave new world um, and doing some pretty interesting things. Tonight's keynote was brought to you by you know, Spring, 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 Spring Framework, Spring Integration, Spring AMQP, Spring HATOS. With a little bit of RabbitMQ, we had the scripted editor, we had the REST shell. Um, there was Cujo for the single page app. Cloud Foundry twice, we had cloudfoundry.com, we had the staging environment, we had SockJs for WebSockets, we had a bit of Node, we had a bit of Express. We had Amazon US East, Amazon EU, uh, EU West. There was some Tmux in there, a little bit of Ruby hiding. That was my colorized scripts. High charts gave me the pretty gauges. Um, the code, if you want to access any of those things that I was showing you, um, I know I went through them really quite quickly. You can find nearly all the code on my GitHub account under A. Collier. These are the links. Uh, some of the other tools, etc., that I showed you. The Monty Hall client app is also in GitHub if you want to stare at how that was built. Um, scripted is up, it's open source. The REST shell is up. Uh, the Cujo libraries that were doing the WAR and the DR, etc., on the client side, 
all available um, out there in open source for your enjoyment. You have been, as always, a wonderful audience. We have been Spring Source. I have been Adrian Collier. Um, it's a pleasure to speak to you. Enjoy the rest of the show. Um, and now I believe, let's dance. <laughs> <laughs>